AI is going to exacerbate the structure process technology piece at the expense of the human piece, when in fact, this could be the best opportunity for human and machine or a human machine interface to reimagine work, to be more fulfilling for people, and to create more value macroeconomically. Welcome to Work Matters, where we explore what leaders can do to make work more productive, valuable, meaningful, and impactful. I'm your host, Thomas Bertels. Our topic today is AI and the future of work. How will AI change work? Will it lead to massive job losses, or does it present a unique opportunity to reimagine work? My guest today is Tony O'Driscoll. Tony has spent his career at the nexus of business, innovation, technology, change, and learning, arguing that the key digital age differentiator is not technology, but people. He is a professor at Duke University, who prior to teaching worked at IBM and Nortel Networks. Tony has written several books and countless articles, and in his latest book, Everyday Superhero, he proposes a people-centered transformation approach to enable sustained and sustainable organization agility. In our conversation, we discuss the need to design work to best utilize human imagination and machine intelligence, the danger of the routinization trap and of cutting the humans out of the loop, the emerging role of the middle manager as a center leader who understands how to design the work context to provide aspiration, alignment, autonomy, and accountability, and the need for a dual operating system that combines the benefits of traditional top-down hierarchy to manage exploitation with a highly networked exploration model that is driven from the middle. And now, without further ado, here's my conversation with Dr. Tony O'Driscoll. Tony, welcome to the show. Great to be here, Tomas. How are you? Maybe just to jump right in, right? Everybody's talking about chat GPT. You know, there's always like a lot of excitement. There's a lot of hype. And, and you've been working at this intersection of you know, strategy, technology, learning, change uh, for a really long time. So kind of where, where do you see AI becoming part of how we work? You're right. So I spent most of my time kind of I'm a technologist by training. I'm an engineer, computer scientist, uh, electrical engineer uh, in, my, in my formal training. And so I've always looked at technology as kind of an enabler of business. But, but then as a student of technology, what you tend to see is very common patterns. W one pattern um, where we met at Drucker Forum, uh, Drucker popularized, is called the, the routinization trap. So whenever a brand new technology emerges, what we first do is use it to automate the past, bad assumptions and all. So it's like, oh, I could use this technology to do my college applications, or I could use this technology, I'm talking about ChatGPT here now, <laughs> I could use this technology to write my marketing paper, right? So it's kind of like we tend to take a brand new technology that might be a large language learning model type AI technology like we're seeing with GTP, but we tend to originally just use it to automate the past. And, and then even today with the internet, you know, when the internet first came out and it was, I believe it was April 23rd, 1993, if I'm not mistaken, where the first browser, Mark Andreessen's, you know, the, the Mosaic browser kind of show, showed up to the world. The HTTP protocol had been around for a long time, but it's, it's when it got um, packaged in such a way that a consumer could say, oh, now I just type in www.ibm.com or that I, 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 now it becomes more uh, fit for human consumption. You know, I could go on there, grandma could go on there, anyone can go on there. Very similar with Google. When I first, I still recall very clearly the first time I saw the Google interface. A friend of mine showed it to me and said, come here, I've got to show you something. And there it was, just an empty box with Google. I said, no. And I typed stuff in and magic happened. I think we're at that inflection point again. It's like, I think if you look at the growth just if you look at market adoption, right, it's six times faster than TikTok to get to a certain number of users. Technology evolves exponentially. We are kind of like analog beings. and We evolve relatively slow. And, and so as humans, we're really wired, I think, to, to do something meaningful, right? We want mastery, we want autonomy, we want purpose in our work. How do you see like AI play against that? What's like the potential for it to deliver and, and, and right, give us work that meets those requirements? Maybe is there a chance to make work better? 
or or is it uh, is it is it just something that's going to erode what humans want to get out of work? You know, when I had the good fortune of reading your book, something that that really stuck with me was this concept of what if you thought of work as a product, and what if you thought of workers as the customer, and what if you thought of management as the designer? Like if you if you take that model, s stealing shamelessly from your book, like that concept, right? Where I think we miss it, uh, Tomas, and this is probably where you and I, you know, I think why we synced up so well when we first met, is that I think what happens is we look at the opportunity. So I'll keep going with the call center example just because it works very well in the GPT context, right? Uh, GPT is a large language model. What it does is it parses all the language and it uses an algorithm to figure out what the next best word would be. And, and it knows how to do that in a certain thing, like give me an Irish limerick on St. Patrick's Day in, in, in William Butler Yeats form, you know, and you'll get it. Um, so it's very, very good at that. So I think if you're domain specific and you say I'm the call center for whatever, Apple, Apple's iPhone, right? They have every transcript of every conversation that's ever been had. You know, if you're on the phone, it says, hey, this will be recorded for training purposes. Okay, so in the old world, we might have used it in a training class. Hey, listen to this. How would you have responded? Now, I don't think you need the human in the loop for this large language model. You may for a while, but it, it, it can literally find out every specific example where somebody asked the question about some obscure function, like how do I turn off do not disturb? And the answer is there. And secondly, now with some of the new technology that's coming out from Microsoft, you can speak into the microphone for three seconds and it, it has your voice down. It, it, I, I did a lot of work um, when, I, when I worked in Singapore and in India, and I worked in many call centers. And, uh, you know, in some of these call centers in India, some of the training was to train people to sound like they came from Milwaukee, to actually develop that. All of that's gone, right? So, so the humans who actually take the calls and look up the systems to look up for the answers, that's all gone because you can literally take that whole canon, every call that was ever made to Apple, asking all the obscure questions, dump that into a large language model. And I would say 99.9% .9 of the questions that would get asked could be done in a fully automated way where the human would say, that passes a Turing test to me. That, that was the most helpful person I've ever had. So there is a, there is a, um, there's a solution. This is great. We can solve that. Now, the part that's missing, though, is they, from a work design perspective, we're just saying, great, we can take humans out of the loop. We can automate that. So now we can take the humans off our balance sheet, right? Because humans are liabilities on the balance sheet, right? <laughs> it's a cost. It's not an asset. Um, and so, cool. That makes our balance sheet look good, which makes us more attractive to whatever. This, somebody wants to buy our stock. Somebody wants to buy our company. I think we're missing something there because I actually feel that computers can do a lot, right? And they can do more and more with, with these new large language models coming out. But they can't. there's one thing they can't do and won't be able to do for, I think, at least a quarter century, they can't imagine. They can't see beyond a horizon, a dark future, a bright future. That's not their job. They, they, they can today, I believe, if you look, I, I'm going to go, I'm going to go away from a GPT large language model now more into more of a, a deep learning like a, um, like AlphaGo. They can much better than humans parse a huge body of data and identify patterns. They have no idea if those patterns are useful or not useful. The human has to determine, oh, wow, that's a pattern in a large set of data that could be useful to me to make my customer happier, to improve my efficiency. But there's no question at all that, that these kind of deep learning uh, neural network type of systems can develop an intelligence that we can't machine intelligence to identify pattern recognition of huge data sets. But there you really do need a human in the loop to kind of say, does that make sense? It's black box. So it spits out and you're like, oh, wow, that's really useful. Let's try that again. Oh, yes, that's really useful. Now we can now we can train the machine to do a particular thing. So it's almost like the human needs to be in the loop for those kind of models. Right. Uh, but in each case, I don't think we're I don't think we're doing it right. I think we ought to adopt your way of thinking, which says, <clears throat> How is work going to change, recognizing that we now have two kinds of assets? We've got human imagination and machine intelligence. And how might we, design thinking question, integrate the best of both? 
Don't try and make the humans identify patterns when they're not capable of. Don't try and make the computers imagine which humans are capable of. And, and if what we want to do is survive and thrive as an organization as we move into an increasingly uncertain future, don't get rid of the people. Keep them because they have imagination. And that's going to allow you the opportunity to find your next horizon, to find your next S-curve, and to grow and jump. I think companies are being too short-sighted to say, we can automate things through computers, or we can use machine intelligence to kind of take the human out of the loop. That'll make our balance sheet look better, so we just drop all those humans. Well, it's like, who's going to imagine what your company's going to become 10 years from now? The computers aren't going to do that. Your people will. So I think there's something that's uniquely human, and I think there's something that's machine intelligence, uniquely machine intelligence. And we are not our managers today, like you're saying, if the manager's the design of the work, we're not giving the autonomy for our managers to understand what these assets are and to design the work to ensure that the company can sustain itself over time through increased uncertainty. And I firmly believe that if the only model, the routinization trap is, great, the computer can automate, get rid of the humans, then, then where you end up with is a DAO, you know, a, 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 a digitally autonomous organization. And there are DAOs. There are companies that exist today that are essentially just algorithms for law, for legal type stuff. There's no humans in them. They're just a whole bunch of rule-based algorithms. Uh, but they, they can't imagine a new future. All they can do is tell, give you the right legal advice given the parameters we understand today. Now, if the legal advice changes, they don't know how to deal with that. You see what I'm saying? So... I, I worry that we're not thinking about the design of the work. There's the work, the worker in the workplace, that we're not thinking about the importance of the human being's imagination married with the new capabilities of machine intelligence to find, to imagine a future heretofore inconceivable because the computers couldn't do what they used to do, and, but we still need the human imagination to do it. And we're cutting the humans out of the loop far more than we should. And managers are the ones who are best positioned, the middle managers, I call them center leaders, to kind of understand how to design the work context, how to create the environment to blend these two new uh, capital bases, human capital in terms of intelligence, machine capital in terms, I'm sorry, in terms of imagination, machine capital in terms of intelligence, and put them together. I, I, don't, I haven't seen really anywhere, uh, I would say Paul Doherty out of Accenture thinks about things this way. You know, human, I call about the human machine interface. He talks about machine and human, and they both bring unique and differentiated qualities to bear. But even there, people aren't talking about it as so. If, the, if that's the new truth, how might we design work the way you advocate for it, where now the manager becomes the designer of the work and it puts these two assets together to, um, to build sustainability into the business? And I don't just mean sustainability ESG, I mean that the business can sustain itself over time. I think it also gets to the point, right, who is going to be the design of work and how does it happen? And, and I feel we're, we're by default always going to this, it gets designed at the top. And we're going to sponsor like a big corporate project and this is going to be our AI initiative. And and I think that that also goes like, to this, this failure of, of imagination or lack of imagination. I think also an alternative pathway that says, this is incredibly powerful technology that's put in the hands of everybody and broadens like the, the, the number of people that are capable of working and, and, and identifying opportunities here and run a thousand experiments at the same time instead of just like running one big experiment. And I would say I would say the challenge there, from my perspective, is that those at the top, <clears throat> there's a similar a similar thing to the routinization trap, which is you take a new technology to automate the past. There tends to be a view, I think, from my perspective. That, well, this is research based. So, so when an exec, when an executive body that's responsible to a board that are the voice of the shareholders, let's talk about a publicly traded company here. Um, if the, this new technology comes along, they're going to say, "Oh, great, let's stick that into call centers because that's going to drive efficiency on our existing model, which is going to mean that we're going to." reduce our cost. We're going to open our jaws of profitability. We're going to reduce our cost of goods sold on unit, and we're going to reduce our overhead on, on labor, maybe even on facilities. And so therefore, we can do the same thing cheaper. If, if all you ever do is always applying new technology to do the same thing cheaper, you're making a very, 
very tenuous decision today strategically, which is that what you do today will continue to deliver value tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And the, the data is super clear on this, that value is migrating far faster today than it is before. Consumer behavior is shifting because if you deliver the same value at a lower price or so on and so forth, people will just move. And so the firms tend to look at, here's a new technology that's going to help me increase the efficiency of my work, maybe even at the expense of the humans, which I think are so important to the work, so that I can be more efficient and make more profit in this cycle. But the more you take an efficiency paradigm to put technology to work, the less you have of imagination to find out all of a sudden your value prop no longer exists. You've been rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic uh, and you've been doing it super efficiently, but people are now using whatever spaceships or something that the whole model has shifted. And, and so I think you lose your, you lose your weak signals to understand how is the market evolving and is what we do today always going to be valuable and just becoming more efficient at something where there's a smaller and smaller market for it over time. Uh, that's, that's not, that's not smart. So I think this this kind of falls into the place of innovation. You know, companies are trying to say we want to we want to innovate, right? <clears throat> and and what they tend to do, again, this is a human centered paradigm, right? What they tend to do is they incrementalize on their product. They're like, oh, here's my super cool Mac. I'm going to put a bigger hard drive in there. I'm going to have a higher resolution display. I'm going to have four speakers instead of six. Whatever it is, like w w each discrete element inside the machine is following Moore's law and is incrementally better, and you're putting it together. But there's somebody else who's working on, um, uh, like Musk, he's working on the, the port into your head. Well, then I won't need a computer or people working on goggles. You see what I'm trying to say? There's no AI that's going to say, are we doing the right thing? We should be working on goggles, not on computers, because two, five years from now, everybody's going to have an interface that's either on their glasses or in, even in a contact lens. That's human. That's human imagination. So I think there's also a tendency where we... We over-rotate in what I call Horizon 1. Horizon 1 is the things we can do today that we can make a profit on. So it's like, let's take this amazing new technology like ChatGPT that could help us imagine a whole bunch of possible futures. Let's run 2,500 experiments of what those possible futures might be. Let's stick them into DALI and see what they might even look like. You know, all of that. No, let's, do, let's use ChatGPT to cut the cost of our call centers. You, 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 yes, it's a useful thing and it's provable and you will gain, but but what about all the other possibilities that this opens up? That's one. But then secondly, back to your book, who designs the work to ensure that the organization can sustain itself in perpetuity? The hierarchy is not the system for an organization to sustain itself in perpetuity. The hierarchy is a system to maximize efficiency in a known context, right? So now I think paradoxically, we have an even better opportunity to have more of a um, higher like model or more of a network type model or more of an organic type model or startups at scale, however you want to call it, supported by both machine intelligence and human imagination. But the hierarchical decision-making is efficiency driven and it tends to hijack the technology to efficiency today versus innovation for tomorrow. And it also is taking humans out of the system because they're seen as a cost within the bureaucracy, but they're the only asset that can imagine what the future will be for the company if you're in, if you're in Horizon 2 or Horizon 3. And so I, I worry about that a little bit, that we, we're not, both from a consumer perspective, if you think about design thinking, design thinking is all about, it's not about incremental product innovation, it's about let's go be with our customer, let's go be with our supplier, let's understand the jobs, pains and gains that they're trying to achieve and let's find a way to get the job done, you know, solve the, solve the pains and gains. It's a very empathic way of understanding. I call that future back customer centric. Well, where will our customers be five years from now? And let's understand the jobs phase the guys are trying to get done. And then let's take whatever resource and capability we have at our disposal and aim it at that, you know, skate to where the puck is going. None of that. GPT can help you do that. GPT can help somebody imagine what a future looks like. But today we're like, no, let's just whatever, automate the back end, reduce the cost in the call center. I'm not saying that's bad. I'm saying it's not the whole story. Yeah, I also can imagine that this 
to your point about like bringing those two sides together. I think there's an opportunity to like put this technology at the disposal of human beings, it's like as a digital twin, to make better decisions um, and, and, and so like leverage the technology. But I think just sticking with the technology itself, I think it's going to become a zero-sum game, right? Because if everybody uses ChatGPT4, then it's like, where's the competitive advantage? It's like SAP, right? Everybody has SAP. It's just like, it's just a standard, right? It just doesn't give you an edge in, in any way, shape or form. That's right. So, so Nicholas Carr, I think, is the one who popularized this whole thing. And at that time, I was at IBM. I think we talked about this, uh, uh, the Jerker Forum. So, so it's kind of like he wrote this book that really upset a lot of the technology providers, Does IT Matter? And his argument, which I, I'm sympathetic to, is you're in a bind, right? Right now, everybody, Microsoft being the prime example because they have partnered with GPT, but trust me, IBM, Cisco, Oracle, they're all going to do the same thing. They're knocking on people's doors right now, companies' doors, and they're saying, hey, <clears throat> it's time for you to AI your call centers because if you don't, your competitors are, and they're going to have 10% more money to whatever, acquire more customers or pay back the share or whatever they're going to use their money for. So you got to do it. So then what's the company going to do? Well, I got two choices. Either I don't do it, then I'm not at parity with my peers. So I have to, I have to, I have to pay for it to do it. But, but the second part of that story is, and when I've done it, we've all achieved parity. We've trained the market that that's what's expected. So there is no there's no so we're back to being in competition. We've just had to spend a whole bunch of money on technology to maintain parity. There's no differentiation there over time. The ones who do it sooner, there'll be differentiation for a while, but then everybody catches up. This is like the Kano model, you know. Um, cars don't rust today. We don't. That's not something we worried about. I remember at first when I lived in Ireland, never buy a Fiat. It rusts. Well, over time, the technology becomes better. We learn about alloys. We learn about this. And now everybody makes cars where we don't expect them to rust. It's the same idea, you know. But I'm saying, well, it's not even like, does the car rust or doesn't it? It's like, who knows? Will, will there be some kind of technology like Star Trek with the transporter that can take all your atoms and push it and reconfigure you? Like, who's thinking about that? Or... Or, or maybe now you don't have to buy a car. Maybe now there's just, you know, I know they're doing trials in Europe for, for kind of drone taxis. Not, not like Amazon for product. It's that imagination. I feel like, especially something like a large language model coupled with Dolly, is you can imagine all kinds of futures that the limitation used to be on. It might be in my mind, but I can't describe it very well because I'm not a very good artist or whatnot. But I've been playing with it. I've been playing with prompts into ChatGPT, throwing them into Dali and seeing what they what what they show you. I'll give you an example. I was talking to a friend who he works for a company that has a large 3D printing uh, capability, right? They, they, they have a large 3D printing capability. And we were talking about ChatGPT. And of course, predictably, they're saying, oh, yeah, we're totally looking at that. We're going to stick it into our call centers. And I said, interesting. That's cool. Right. I said, but how about this? Um, how about if you said to ChatGPT, hey, ChatGPT, and you dumped it into Dolly, say, hey, create a form that would be comfortable for a human to sit in or lounge in. Don't use the word chair. Don't use the word chair because otherwise it'll go to chairs. And it might come up with something completely different. And it might be the kind of form. One of the things about 3D printing that's very interesting is you can create forms that you actually can't make out of pieces. But they are st they still have structural integrity. In other words, when you 3D print something, you have less limitations in how you build it. And I said, wouldn't it be interesting to just see what the machine would come back with? And then you've got 3D printing capability and you could make something completely new that a human wouldn't have even thought about. You know, so that's what I mean about. So here's the exact same technology where in the one case we can do the absolute sure known thing and reduce the cost structure of our call centers, which is not an insignificant cost. And yet we're doing that at the expense of perhaps fundamentally reshaping this, what your capability to, 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 to print in 3D to do something completely unique and differentiated nobody else could do. Th this is what I mean about the tension between the two. Left to our own devices, on average, we go for the known thing that's efficiency driven and we leave too much opportunity on the table, I think. And, and, and the thing I worry about more, back to your kind of concept, which I'm really sympathetic to, is the humans get squeezed out of the equation when we're playing the efficiency game. And it's precisely those humans, arguably the ones that sit in the middle of the firm, not the ones at the top, who are the ones that can be the real engines 
of co-creative endeavor between the machines and the people. That's at least what I believe. I mean, technology always has like unintended consequences. Email, for example, right, obviously is right, enables, I think, much faster asynchronous communication, but it also uh, has led to like people being overwhelmed uh, by messages and, uh, and, and, you know, basically right, the, our, our brains are not wired for this bombardment of emails that say, pay attention to me, pay attention to me, right? And as a result, I think people, I think, uh, increasingly experience burnout, right? It's like a side effect of the technology. Nobody thought about it, right? Think about AI. What's like the doomsday scenario? What are the unintended consequences that, that we should be thinking about? There's two things I want to say. I want to say that I was part of the reinventing email uh, research at IBM. So I was, I was actually in a group. I worked at IBM Research at the time. And the most beautiful thing about that project was we had to turn off our email. So in this project, we were trying to say, though IBM had been consumed by email at that point in time, and we were seeing how it was a real um, cycle time burner. You know, you're just sitting there. Should we go get a beer? Where should we go? What time are you free? Like all this kind of nonsense stuff going back and forth that was not useful. Um, and so I ended up with something like 200,000 unanswered emails during the three months that I wasn't there. And since that time, I, I very rarely use email. And I tell my students, I'm like, I look at it twice a day. I, do, I don't let it rule my life. I don't have any of these uh, bings or, t you know, all these like alarm. They're, they're, they're all always off because task switching, um, Clifford Nass, who you may know, um, when you get interrupted, it takes a long time to get back on task. And so with all this multiple uh, interruptions through email and this, and did you get my email? And then, then they call you on text and so on and so forth. You, you never have any kind of actual time to soak into the nuance of a problem. You see what I'm trying to say? And I think, so from an email perspective, I think email is a killer app. It's killing people in terms of just their attention span, right? ADT is a real thing. It's in HBR, even had an article. It's like not attention deficit disorder like some people have. I actually have ADD, uh, but there's ADT. It's just like the context is so interrupt driven. I, I don't know what not being interrupted is. I don't know what being bored is. I don't know what having an hour to just kind of have to myself is because there's just too many sources of interruption. Now, when it gets to AI, <clears throat> I mean, it depends on what you're talking about. Like my, my short term scenario, what I'm worried about is that the the hunger to automate, to maximize profitability in the short term and the flushing out of people right through the hierarchy, uh, number one, reduces the opportunity for the company to find its next opportunity beyond the horizon because your, your imagination coefficient has gone down because you're getting rid of more gray matter. Um, uh, so, so that's that's a problem I see in the short term. The long term scenario is 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 what's what's called the alignment problem. So the alignment problem says, and, and look, this is uh, there is nobody. There are experts on this, and they come down on both sides, right? So I come down on Russell Stewart Russell's side, uh, but others say the op say, say it's not true. But my, my what they say is, um, if a computer the AI will only do what you tell it to do. This is why we're seeing the instances of biases today. Like, you know, if you, if you interrogate AIs, maybe they have a little bit of a Silicon Valley left liberal bias here in the United States. And in fact, um, Lenovo, the company Lenovo, actually, they boast that. They say we're East and West. So our, you know, how we're programming our AI will be a little bit more balanced, so to speak. That's that's one of their arguments. But the alignment problem is that the the machine doesn't know what human values are. So, if, so the, the, the example is the paperclip maximizer. Ultimately, if you tell an AI that we value paperclips over everything else, they will optimize to make everything a paperclip because they don't know any better. Um, and, so, and so how do you have this machine intelligence that we can't even understand what it does? You know, it's black box to us. It just shows us what the patterns are. How can you train it to adopt human values. That's the first question. The second question is, are there universal human values? No, they're not. They, they're, they arguably should be, but in different parts of the world, there are different things that we value. So in an AI database regime, let's say like China, um, the data can be used to say, hey, you broke this law, you broke this law. Surveillance capitalism is what Shoshana Zuboff calls it. So now we're going to take your passport away. 
you can't leave the country kind of thing. So it could be very surveillance oriented, right? In the US, it's more like, oh no, we want things to be super convenient for you. So we're just going to watch your kind of data trail and then we'll surface surface things for you that you'd like, you know, swipe left, swipe right for a human being or swipe left, swipe right for a product that you might want to buy or an influencer that you want to connect with or whatnot. And we're just making it convenient for you. Convenience is new cash. Europe is taking a much more kind of measured approach where they're saying, hey, if you're the creator of the data, you ought to somehow be able to profit from that, right? Not, not, not either the government or. So there's different data regimes. That kind of reflects a different set of values. And the AI is going, well, who am I serving here? Like the AI in a, in a, in a kind of more autocratic regime that says the data there is, is there to control the people, we'll do that. And the AI that's more about, hey, convenience for the consumer, we'll do that. And the AI that's more about, hey, you know, you should, I'm more on the European side, which kind of says now, going back to what you said earlier, um, we've tended to think of digital twins in very much the efficiency model, Tomas. So Rolls-Royce will have a digital twin of every engine that they have on whatever, on a Singapore Airlines plane or whatnot. And, and, and be, they have real-time data going into that. And then they're running all kinds of tests to say, is this engine going to blow a gasket or whatnot? Because you don't want an engine to blow a gasket. I don't know. I don't know if a turbo fan has a gasket, but anyway, that the metaphor will hold, hopefully. That kind of says, we, we, we don't want you to realize the engine's going to blow up when you're flying. We want to know it beforehand. So it's worthwhile building a digital twin that is a high fidelity mirror of what's going on. Uh, in the future, I could see uh, that we that we have anthro digital twins, that, that there literally is, and you and I talked about this offline, I think last week, where I'm, I'm, I'm literally now in the process of taking every transcript from every lecture I've done at Duke, which is a lot, and dumping him into a large language model and putting a version of myself, an avatar version of myself up, so that instead of having office hours, the students can ask questions, right? Now, you could imagine, as the technology gets better, what you now need is your digital twin that understands what you like and what you want, being your advocate into the, into the world so to speak, right? In terms of, do I release this data or don't I? I've got um, the head of one of the largest um, uh, pl placement firms in the United States coming to speak to my people analytics class on Monday. We were just talking before this call. And um, he said right now, with the new technology that's coming out, in the old world, the way that they worked was Microsoft would call them and say, we need 500 blah, blah programmers, JavaScript programmers go find me 500. It was kind of like body shop, you know, just get me some carbon based life forms who know how to do Java and send them to me. Right. Um, and that was their model. The clients were the big firms and the human beings were the fodder. Just find me more fodder. He said, the model shifting now is, Hey, I want to be your Jerry Maguire. I'm, I'm going to be your agent. And if you, if what you want to do is be an engineer, but you'd like to work in New Zealand for three months out of the year, cause you like the wine or something down there or whatever, we can, we can kind of engineer your life, your work. Actually, I don't, I hate this term work life balance. It's life. And then it's work and leisure. <laughs> life is above those two, but that's, that's a whole different story. But, but, but you now could imagine almost having a digital twin of yourself whose job it is, is to make sure that you get this work leisure balance sort of the way that you want it to. And back to what you were talking about earlier is this thing knows me. It's like, Hey, Tony, uh, you're leaving $300 a month on the table because your mortgage could be cheaper. Right. And Oh, by the way, you're, you, you don't need this car anymore. Cause it, like, in other words, it's just always trying to optimize for what you want to do in your, work leisure balance so that you have an overall more holistic life wouldn't it be better to have the technology aimed on what's your five-year goal what would you need to know to get there and let me be your personal agent that navigates this whole data universe to to, to get the financial aspect of it the the mindfulness aspect of it it's just it's it's an ai it right now our ais are optimized to you know, command our attention to control our consumption. That's the algorithm. And they're very, very good at that. If you understand, it's amazing if you think about how it works, right? From a marketing perspective, if I type something into Google, like pink Wellington boots, and I hit enter, if you think about what's behind all of that, from the time I hit enter to the time that what's painted on the screen for the search is DSW, discount shoe warehouses, pink Wellington boots, 
They have gone back in. They figured out I said pink Wellington boots. They know what my disposable income is. They, there's a back end marketplace. Dis, discounted warehouses said they'll pay this much money, and Omega Sports said they'll pay this much money. They do the whole trade on that. They barter that. They do the transaction on it, and then they paint discount warehouse on the screen, like. That's in the nanosecond from when I hit enter. That's a very sophisticated algorithm. Now, it's a very sophisticated algorithm that in my mind is tuned to the wrong thing. I want to control Tomas's consumption, uh, attention, so I can push stuff at him to buy. Well, why can't you instead, uh, I want to, uh, your job, Jerry Maguire AI, is to optimize Tony's life, to allow him to be healthy, to live longer, to do what he's passionate about creatively. Uh, and for me, that would involve travel. That's what I want. And then it goes, well, do you want to own your house or would you like to sell your house? And that can generate you $3,400 a month and you could live anywhere on the planet for $3,400 a month without ever having to own the house anymore. Is that something you'd like to do? It's not something I would have ever considered unless I knew. But now I've got a personal coach who understands all of that, whose job it is, is for me to become my best fulfilled self, my best self as I've defined it. I think that's equally possible. And, and, and when you have the capability of technology to maximize human flourishing and fulfillment, why the hell are we using it to optimize call centers? Doesn't make sense to me. If you think about managers, right? So right now you mentioned right, the Cisco, the IBMs, they all start to line up and say, you gotta do this. Uh, what advice would you give them? What, what should they do? How can they prepare themselves for this brave new world, right? Because oftentimes right, people in management tend to be right, a little bit older. So this is probably not something that comes natural for them, but how can they get themselves ready to step into this new world and, and be effective designers of work? Yeah, well, I think they have to let go. I mean, I think that's part of the problem. So, so I want to be really clear on this because now we're getting into the, the, the area of the, the book I most recently wrote, Everyday Superhero. And when I wrote that book, I really only wrote that about the, about the innovation opportunity side of the equation. I want to, I want to be very clear when I say that, um, I don't want an innovator doing my accounting. And I, I just brought my taxes to my tax guy, right? I don't want to hand that to Steve Jobs and say, hey, have fun with this. <laughs> no, I want to make sure that everything that I've done is by the rules, right? So I think the hierarchy works really well for certain things. When 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 the outcome is known and when, when all the variables, if I pull pull this lever and I push this, I will get this outcome. So number one is predict. I know what outcome I'm looking for. And number two, I know exactly how to get that outcome depending on what I do. The hierarchy works great. And there is still a whole lot of things where the hierarchy works great for. Uh, for instance, it works really great to figure out which of all these options would make the most sense. Then a hierarchy is great because it's good at saying no. Uh, but I think every organization needs to have a dual operating system now. It needs to have the exploit operating system to maximize the profitability in the here and now, and the hierarchy works well for that. But it also needs an explore operating system that's far more organic, that's far more networked, that's far more trial and error driven. And I don't believe that that should be driven from the top. I don't think that's a top down thing. I think that's a middle out thing. And that's where this notion of a center leader comes from. We tend to think of middle managers as dinosaurs. And we should just get rid of them all and let technology do the job. Perhaps in the hierarchy, there's some element of truth to that, right? That if it's just all rules based, why do you need a human in a loop? But if you are trying to innovate and explore and look to the horizon, you absolutely need humans in a loop. And a hierarchy doesn't work very well. If you think about a, if you think about a firm, today firms, it's about idea flow. How many ideas do we have flowing through? And then how many decisions do we make about those ideas to give them the opportunity to grow? or to kill, right? So the creative part of that is about idea flow. Well, that's where you need a much more organic um, uh, system that's not hierarchical, and you have to create, kind of create a culture that's far more, like you said, more trial and error driven you know, than wrong or right driven. And I firmly believe that in that second operating system, those in control at the top need to let go and cede control to the middle managers, which I now call in the new model center leaders, because they sit between strategy and results and they sit between culture and people. They're the, they, they're, it's almost like they sit right in the middle and they're like a propeller that can propel the organization forward to that new horizon because they have the best perspective. They know immediately if a strategy that the, that the senior leaders bring down, they know immediately if it'll work or not. 
They're like, the people won't go for that. You know, there'll be malicious compliance. They, they'll know if it won't fit with the culture. So I firmly believe <clears throat> that middle managers are not dinosaurs. They are dynamos. They're center leader dynamos. And through their perspective of understanding strategy, results, uh, um, culture, and people, what they can do is create a culture of aspiration. This is where we want to go together. Alignment. We agree we want to go there. Autonomy. You do this really well. Why don't you do that bit? I do this really well. Why don't I do that bit? Right? And accountability. I'm counting on you to do it. I'm not going to be all over you to do it. I'm not going to be a gopher delegator. I'm not going to tell you how to do it. I trust that you have the autonomy, mastery, and purpose like you were talking about earlier on. And I'm going to amp you up so you can go do it. But you're passionate about doing it because it's the thing that you feel you have the most to contribute. You're unlocking your discretionary effort to get to that outcome. And then you get this flywheel of opportunity. Now, what that then does is open up a huge aperture of possible progression paths, I call them. And then the hierarchy can be goal to cut down which progression parts are most worth investing in. That's where the hierarchy is really good. Otherwise, everybody want to keep going on those progression paths. But where I think we're lacking now is on this possibility of progression paths. Why is there nobody working on an anthro digital twin for human flourishing and fulfillment? Like, wouldn't that be a super cool subscription service five years from now? Why wouldn't Google work on that instead of using ChatGPT to optimize their call center? If you think about the micro enterprises, yeah, like this, the higher idea that GE kind of adopted, that's a great story in a way. It's a, a very classical appliance company had mediocre growth for 25 some years. You know, you and I both talked to Kevin about this, right? I think. Um, and then they adopt this new structure, which basically is the center feeds the edge. <laughs> it's not like come from the edge to the altar and kneel and pray to get, get some budget. It's no, the center feeds the edge. The edge seizes these crazy opportunities that even Kevin, the CEO of the company said, I thought it was the craziest idea ever but I'm not allowed to kill ideas. The CEO, I'm not allowed to kill ideas. I have to, they know better than me, they're closer to the edge, which I think is true. Because I also feel another Druckerism that, that, that I love is bottlenecks are at the top of the bottle. So imagine GE appliances kind of, imagine GE appliances touch, touch points with all of the stakeholders outside the firm. That's where a new opportunity emerges. In the current model, it has to move its way through the hierarchy and then on up into the decision maker. And then they decide and then it comes back out and goes back out. Well, it's too late by that time. The market's already moved. Yeah. When, when we proceduralize things for efficiency, right? Um, and then we, you know, I, I tend to pick on SAP, but it could be IBM. It could be whomever. It's kind of like a lot of that is then training the humans to conform to the technology, which we find to be just pure drudgery. It's like, oh my God, this is the most boring thing ever. As human beings, as creative as we are, as kind of curious as we are, if we're just put into this box and we're literally monkey see, monkey do, that's not going to unlock discretionary effort. That's not a human, like it's, it's torture to me. It's a form of torture. Um, and so I, I think, unfortunately, a lot of the work doesn't get designed. It's like, oh, technology can automate something and then the humans have to conform. But human conformity is more like, it's more like torture. We, we don't think about the worker. We don't think about what are we doing to unlock their creativity, their discretionary effort. It's more like, oh, if we can automate something and get rid of the human, that's great. Well, that only, that only lasts so long until you then regress to a mean of mediocrity as a firm and you get punished by the market because you haven't done anything new or novel. My sense is that the more and more technology we pour into organizations, the more technical debt we accumulate. And, and so right, humans end up so like paying down that debt, right, or, or servicing that debt. And, and just like many things just never get fixed. And so I think we just end up with like the most unattractive work on the planet. And I think that's really, that's really dangerous. But we also, we're servicing the debt on the, we're servicing the debt on the part that number one, we're probably not best at, and number two, that is the most disincenting, demoralizing, draconian. Do you, you see what I'm trying to say? It's like, your example is great. Like when I worked at IBM, we made a bunch of money doing middleware because back then the technology architectures didn't have APIs. So we're like, okay, we'll go blow a hole in the piece of software you bought here. We'll blow a hole in the piece of software right here and we'll do some MacGyverism. At least that was interesting for the engineers because it was like, we have to blow a hole in this and this and kind of do something super creative to make it work. But what you're saying is different. There's a technology thing here and a technology thing here, and it hasn't figured it out. So you, the human, need to kind of take file A, 
this is what I was a computer guy, right? I was a tech, uh, an electrical engineering computer guy. I didn't mind it in school because you had a whole project. You had the hardware, you had the software, you made something. I hated it when I started working because I felt like I was in, you know, level 22 in the basement of a company. And on my screen would come a bunch of inputs. And then it says, use some computer software to manipulate those inputs to make this outputs. I don't know what the outputs are. I don't know where they're going next. They're going to floor 21 <laughs> and somebody else is picking them up. And then ultimately they might see a customer back on floor one, you know, three months later. But I felt so removed from what's actually going on. I was just kind of doing symbol manipulation from left to right. And I was like, I, I can't do this for 20 more years. I have to go back and get my MBA and figure something out. I just had, and I, and I, I so am I an anomaly? I just, I don't think so. I think that every human being, you know, they might settle for that, but I don't think intrinsically that it's kind of fulfilling. Do you know what I mean? They might settle for it, but I don't think it's intrinsically fulfilling. And they might only settle for it because they need to earn the money to do something that actually they consider as creative, right? I'm a jazz musician. I got to do eight hours a day of mind numbing work. I actually want to do a job that doesn't require me to think. And that's fair. Then you've taken that trade. But my question is back to what you're saying is that's a failure of work design, not a failure of that person. Shame on us. Who, whoever we are, firms, da, da, da. I just don't think we've actually thought about it. You know, there used to, there was a discipline, and I think you and I talked about this, called Human Performance Technology, HPT, where you really understand what are the, what are the components of human performance, like it's data, it's tools, it's motivation, like it's not that hard, right? It's, it's training, the right adequate training, it's the incentives. And, and, and why are we not engineering the context why this is what i believe i believe the center and the center leader is a contextual engineer who can bring the right capabilities to bear unlock the discretionary effort of those people to imagine what's possible and then giving them all the affordance financial and technological to see that possibility come to fruition because they feel ownership in it and i feel like you said earlier we're at the cusp of being able to do this at scale with every human in the company with their counterparts outside the company and that could unlock such a huge amount of value i'm just mean econ macroeconomically speaking and yet what we're trying to do is is again routinization trap shoehorn that technology back into maximizing efficiency in this one part of the business because it's it's right there in front of us and we know that we'll get 10 to 15 percent out of it i'm not saying you shouldn't do that i'm saying it's that's not enough that's table stakes let's go do the other stuff too which I think requires PCT, people-centered transformation, which I think you, you, you mentioned it before, but I want to um, quickly flesh this up. So you wrote this book, Everyday Superhero. And this is a really unusual book. It's written as a graphic novel. And so first of all, I love novels, but uh, I mean, novels with pictures, like how much better does it get? Uh, tell us a little bit about the book and, and how, you, how you came up with that idea. Well, I, you know, a lot of what I was just saying about all these claims about, you know, we're routinizing the past and all that. I, I, I'm a strategy guy, so I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, and Brightline, uh, that's PMI's, um, you know, research side, research arm of Project Management Institute, came to me and said, look, we got this problem. The problem is that many people are running projects to implement strategies and they're failing 70% of the time. So there's some there's something going wrong. Can you help us try to figure that out? So that the, the this is a more um, it was like a meta analysis of the research to try to say what are the what are the contributing factors to an express strategy? What we know we want to do, what we feel is the right thing to do, that's good for the firm to do, doesn't get done now. So this the the problem actually is not about strategy formulation as much as about strategy execution. Now execution in the English language means two things: to do. Or to kill and unfortunately 70 percent of the time the strategy gets killed not done <laughs> it, it, it just never it's it, sometimes it's doa it's dead on arrival people just don't want to do it because they but there's two reasons why the people don't do it they don't they don't understand they don't get the they don't understand it they don't understand the why behind it what the motivation is or they don't believe it's going to work right so either one of those you're going to get what's called malicious compliance people on other heads but the ball's not being moved forward right and the reason for that is people don't resist change 
look, we're still around. We've been around for millennia because we are adaptable and we want to survive. But we do resist being changed. We resist being changed. And so that's the problem, right? The problem is, I think, when we start to think about, oh, we have a whole new technology, we could automate this, and then we could train people to use the system, and then they will use the system, uh, and, but they weren't involved in what the change is in the first place, there's no motivation. There, why would I do this? This is just basically messing up how my life used to be. I'm not even questioning whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. It's just like I wasn't involved. Uh, so I actually think people center transformation is let's start with the humans, whether that's the customers, whether that's the people in your value chain, in your supply chain, whether that's, and, and let's kind of take a human centered view to what is the problem and how might we as a group of humans design this solution and the work processes to go with it. If I could include you know, your great book, so that we can create value all around, as opposed to just kind of looking at through structure, process, and technology, which is what we typically tend to look at change through. Let's change the org. Let's do a new org structure. Let's implement this new process. And oh, wow, we've got this great, cool technology that goes along with it. And there's an app that goes with that. And then let's just train everybody. And then we'll declare victory. 100% implemented technology does not a change organization make. I mean, we know this. But yet we assume that because we can say, oh, yes, we have now declared the reorg transformation over. No, it's not. No, it's not. Oh, great. We have a new process and we have the uh, there's 90 percent adoption. Well, that means that everybody goes in on a Friday, hits two keys because that's the requirement and, and leaves because they weren't involved. So people center transformation is kind of saying we got the cart before the horse. Right. We've got the structure process technology cart before the human and emotional horse belief must come be belief and behavior must come before structure process technology. And we just need to be more human about it, which I think is essentially everything we've been saying previously. The problem today though, Tomas, is that AI is going to exacerbate the structure process technology piece at the expense of the human piece. When in fact, this could be the best opportunity for human and machine or a human machine interface to reimagine work, to be more fulfilling for people and to create more value macroeconomically. I just don't think we're seeing that. Wonderful. Excellent. Listen, I, I know Tony, we could probably go on forever and ever, right? Uh, I, I remember our conversation in Vienna and, uh, um, and, and so, but, but there are limitations, right? This is probably by now a, this is by now a two parter, but thank you so much, um, for coming on the podcast and, uh, Again, I'd, I'd encourage everybody, you know, check out Everyday Superhero. It's a fun read. It's always a pleasure chatting with you. We hope you enjoyed this discussion. If you did, be sure to subscribe, like, share, or comment. Until next time, let's make work matter.